Okay, merci aux organisateurs pour l'invitation, ça me fait bien plaisir d'être ici. Je vous ai amené des, des, euh, des germes de Vancouver, j'ai un petit rhume, donc je m'excuse si euh, ma prononciation n'est est pas parfaite. Et, euh, je vais faire la présentation en anglais, juste parce que mes slides sont en anglais pour la plupart, et que j'ai l'impression que tout le monde comprend l'anglais, ce qui n'est pas forcément le cas pour le français. So we've been talking in this, in this um, a workshop about, about uh, movement and, and bodies and the interaction with technology. And what happened with the computerization of society, it, it was fast, very, very fast, radical. It was non-democratic, so you know, nobody voted for it, and all of a sudden you all have a computer on you, sometimes several. And, um, and then it was, not, it was designed as we could. Um, and so we have machines that are not really appropriate for human bodies, as you can see in this illustration there. So now in human-computer interaction, and I'm a computer scientist specialized in AI and machine learning. I'll talk about that in a second. We're going back to human-centered interaction design, and it's about time, and it's going to take a while. Um, so we're definitely moving from embodied cognition to embodied interaction. I teach myself a class called Body Interface, and if those classes are being taught to computer scientists and designers, then that's going to make a change uh, in the future. Uh, the problems we have with dealing with movements and dealing with the bodies with computers is that, unlike for natural language, because computers are symbolic machine processing, right? They process only symbolic information. And for language, we have a symbolic notation. It's called writing. It works super well. For music and other uh, media, we have a notation system. For movement, we do not have a notation system, at least not one that is easily readable by computers, one that is formal, reproducible. And so, like we, everyone knows what a punch is uh, or, 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 or what a caress is, a computer doesn't, and there's no way for us to say it to the computer, it's really hard, and each time you use a different type of computer, it's going to manifest itself by different numbers, therefore different data. That's a big problem. So with Tecla Shifots and a bunch of people in a multi-million dollar project, we started building a series of tools for movement computing, and so, sort of uh, jumpstart this field of uh, movement uh, computing by uh, offering uh, free online data, because if you don't have data in the world of computers, you don't really exist. So for example, the lab annotation is well established, but you will not find digital annotation uh, and, and machine readable anno lab annotation. Therefore, for computer scientists, it doesn't really exist because there's no data. So we started doing that, and it's available uh, online. And we, uh, of course, encourage anyone who is capturing movement data to upload their data there because it's free and open source. We develop tools to visualize uh, movement, to visualize uh, movement features, to annotate uh, movement, and to compare movement text in the precise and, and, and even more uh, geeky tools about allowing movement information to flow in and out of systems. So I won't talk about that much because that's going to bore everyone really quick. But there's advances, is what I'm saying, to the point that we started with my colleague Tecla Schifford and some colleagues from IACAM and Paris 6 in Paris, a new conference five years ago called Movement Computing. It's now an ACM conference, well-regarded conference, and it's growing, and next year it'll be, yeah. So we started this conference a few years ago, and, um, yeah, and the next edition will be next year at ASU in Arizona, and I think a lot of people in this community will actually benefit and appreciate. It's a gathering of choreographers, movement experts, both in cognitive science, in computer science, sometimes in robotics, anyone interested by the inter inter intersection between movement and computer science. Okay, so that's my little introduction and some pitch to what this other community that I think would connect well. My specialty in the lab I direct is called the Meta Creation Lab, and I'm an artificial intelligence researcher, and I focus on AI for the, for the automation of not regular tasks, but of, for creative tasks. I do that because I think that uh, computers are annoying. I don't want to interact with them. I just want to give them work to do and come back when the work uh, is done. There's too many people spending too much time in front of a computer. That is for sure. If you want a, a bit more formal of a definition of the field, creative AI, it's called meta creation, sometimes computational creativity, some sometimes artificial creativity. It's basically the science uh, or practice that aims to partially or completely automate creative tasks. And creative tasks are defined as the tasks for which there's no optimal solution. So AI started with the military, uh, how to launch a rocket from A to B. Um, there's a, there's a, if you fall not in B, then you're not, doing, you're not achieving your goal, so there's a goal. Then, you know, playing games and rational problem solving, uh, putting pieces of cars together, uh, winning at Go or at chess, there's a winner or a loser. 
But when it comes to the use, the modern use of computers, the main use of computers in the world is not the military anymore. It's not the industry anymore. Surprisingly, it's creative computing. It's people in Photoshop retouching pictures, people using video editing tools, music making software tools, and those guys might have a very clear idea of what they want to do, and they are, they're going to have to click on buttons one by one for hours, days, sometimes weeks. And it's not necessarily as fun as it sounds to do creative computing uh, that way. So the idea is to try to bring AI technology to automate, um, at least partially, some creative tasks. Some artists are doing it on the left side here, and that's called generative art in that case. It's an art practice in which the artist delegate a little bit of its autonomy to a process. It's nothing new. We do it very well with computers now. And on the uh, right side here, you get computational creativity, which is really the science of doing that. What is creativity? Can we model it? If we can model it, because it's probably a complex phenomena, uh, can we make simulations with computers to test if the model is right or wrong? If ever a model is right, then we can do applications. And often the applications are going to be of two kinds. They're going to be purely generative systems. Ge for example, we make in, our, in my lab systems that generate music, and then we make experiments to see if humans can tell that those systems are made by a machine. They can't. What do we learn? What does it change if we tell humans that it's m music generated by a computer? It does change quite a bit in that case. But often, instead of purely generative systems, we develop computer-assisted uh, creativity system where the human and the computer are going to interact. So one of the classic, we work with a company in Germany called Ableton. They make music making software. One of the plugins we're developing for them is you choose a bunch of songs you like, and you're like, okay, give me new songs, new composition in that style. Oh, no, I don't like this one. Give me another one. Oh, no, I don't like this one. Give me another one. Oh, this one I like, except for the bass. Can you change the bass? Oh, no, not this bass. Where is this bass? Oh, I can work with that. Now I start editing, and in a few uh, hours or minutes, I get days of work done. So we do that, and we use those systems to make music. So that's the idea of computer-assisted creativity. You interact with the machines, and the machines make propositions, recommendations, and then eventually you work from there. What's interesting is it allows some time to do things that you could not do on your own. If I want to do um, chord progression in the style of Path Metheny as a composer, I'm not going to be able to do that. With such an AI system, I can. I load all the composition of Path Metheny, and the system is going to give me new ones. So that's an example of machine-generated uh, um, machine music. So we do that, and we also do generative visuals, um, using what we call the computationally uh, sublime. We try to make systems that are so complex, a bit like when you watch the clouds or the trees. There's too much information for your brain to process, and there's a sense of ah that happens. So if you put the two together, we can have the system generate automatically on stage both images and sound. That's um, Ars Electronica with collaborators from um, Turkey called Uch. And she's standing in a room that is a lot bigger. It's called Deep Space 8K, one of the main uh, rooms in the Ars Electronica Museum. And um, there's 8K production on the floor, 8K on the ceiling. And for 20 minutes, the resolution is really, really high in that room. This screen and my poor iPhone tech can't give reason to that. But uh, you barely can't move because your brain is just processing all those images and sound uh, as fast as they go. And then it goes into different scenes and different generative uh, algorithms at different uh, stage. Uh, we did that more recently by playing live with what we call a musical agent on stage and generating, um, generating uh, imagery at SAT, which I, I guess a lot of people here would know, Society for Art and Technology. That was, we played a couple of times. The last time was during the last edition of Mutech. A, but a bit more, a bit more than a, yeah, thank you. A bit more than a month uh, ago. All right, and now I'm going to focus on what we do in terms of creative AI with uh, movement, because that's really the body and the movement is key uh, there. So we, we did some art and we started working with Tekla uh, Shifford. We used to work with Mercy Cunningham and, and John Cage back in the days, and one of the first uh, author of a software to make offline choreography. And we started working and we were like, okay, but you know, those uh, animated characters are not really nice, so let's use video of real dancers. And we invented this idea of video sprites where we can take a dancer and decompose all the movement of the dancer in terms of little, little granular bits of video and recompose all those little bits of videos to make new movements of the dancer. And we do facade projection, um, facade projection uh, artworks with that, some small and here at the camp, some bigger with larger number of 
of virtual performers because then uh, because they're virtual you can repeat them as much as you want and have a big group of dancers occupying a facade. And what we do a lot uh, when we uh, mix AI and creative tasks is that we make artworks but we also take this opportunity to make scientific research. Um, if only because we like the money from Encirc and Shirk and in fact to do, <laughs> to do really good art it's pretty nice to get scientific level funding because that's more money than you would get if you do solely art. So this is an example of a very a good example of embodied interaction. It's a simple VR piece where you have a breath sensor and uh, when you breathe in you go up and you breathe out you go down. What it does is it maps your breath which typically if you're not doing yoga or meditation you're breathing but you're not really aware of it. It maps it to your visual cortex which won't let anything go and therefore anyone is super aware of their breath like a super master yogi and, uh, and then we can change that mapping add viscosity or change goals of where you need to go and we can regulate the amplitude and the magnitude of your breath and we can study that, that it works and so scientifically in terms of medicine etc it has uh, manifestation so we do both the scientific work and also we develop an artistic piece out of it, right? So you get both words coming together. We like doing that. We do that a lot when we do um, AI systems. Um, we wanted to get um, to do generative movement. And it's one of the hardest things to generate because, uh, because humans are really complex and it's temporal and there's a lot of things happening in parallel, yet there's constraints between my two arms. They can't go, my two hands can't go as far apart as I might want them to because of the body, and then movement is really expressive. So one research I want to spend a few minutes talking about is uh, the, the work we did on expressive movement generation. We started by collecting data, because for computer uh, science and machine learning, that's where it starts. And we asked a bunch of uh, actors and dancers to, let's say, walk with various uh, e uh, expressive type of movement. So walk and, and be happy, walk and be excited, walk and be very sad, work can be tired. This is the balance and arousal model, one of the main continuous uh, model of uh, emotions and affect. And so they did. And then we made an experiment with over a thousand people. Can people, when they look at the motion capture of those dancers, no <coughs> facial expression, a lot of emotions come through the face, but without facial expression, can you tell if this dancer was portraying happy or sad <coughs> while just walking? Turns out that they can. Do people agree? That's what we call the anti retro agreement. Across cultures, across gender, across age, turns out they can. Because they can perceive it and they agree, then we can train a machine to do so. And now we have machines where you get into the room and your computer knows if you're happy or sad, if you're excited or, or if you're very tired. And so we train, so we can use that classifier, that recognition machine, there's plenty of applications for that. Uh, talk to the people of Microsoft and the HoloLens. Um, and then we can train deep neural networks to try to capture the movement style. Do like style imitation, but not for music, for your movement. And this is such a neural network generating, this is not mocap, now I can change the direction live of this generated character that is imitating someone's style, performer let's say number one, which I think is a male in that case. And then because of the latent space of the neural network, I can change performer and I can move to a female walk another performer. There's a bit more hip uh, balancing actually on the female walk and move smoothly between my style, your style, and your styles. If you're an animator and you have 11 million players in World of Warcraft, how many animations do you need to generate because they all play on average 20 hours per week? Well, way too many. So you gotta go generate it. So the systems are really important. Now I can control how excited, tense, and or tired the uh, worker because I have those different emotional states that I can interpol between. Looking miserable, looking more proud and happy. Can people tell the difference between that and an actual actor being more capped? They can't. That's what we call a human competitive AI system, when AI does at least as good as humans. Um, it happens in a lot of domains, and if you played with a chess game recently, there's domains in which AI is more than human competitive, as in you won't win anytime soon. Um, then we started, so that's the science part of it in a way, 
um, where we have like really fundamental knowledge about human perception. Yes, we can perceive emotion from just movement and posture. And then we went further in, in more artistic exploration. Okay, now can I train a neural network to dance? <coughs> so we feed the music and the dancing of mocap, uh, mocap text of, of dancers. In that case, they're just grooving on some of the electronic music we generate. And we get the neural network to dance. And it doesn't get it quite right which talking with choreographers is actually probably more interesting than if you would get it right, because then you get the neural network sort of trying to dance and getting, getting on the beat and getting okay, but not totally right. So this is how it looks. So it's simply, simply grooving. And what's interesting is I can feed, so this is going, uh, this is work in progress. I'm not done, done yet with that. This is gonna be a museum installation where you have an holographic uh, avatar and you plug your iPhone, you play the music and it starts dancing on your music no matter what the music is. That's what we call in machine learning generalization. I can record a dancer on a bunch of songs and then play a new song that the system nor the dancers have ever seen and it will generate new movement for that. So this is generative dance on generative music. Generative music, by the way, which is a growing, growing field, um, is coming now uh, in the, for the first time in the top 40 in Europe. There's a song of Stromae that is machine generated by a colleague of mine called Francois Pachet. So it's coming uh, to the masses. Uh, right now because it's good. And we are selling house music albums that are played in clubs that are generated by machine. We do not tell people it's made by machine though. We create persona because they, they, they will not take it uh, the same way. That's called the bias against computational creativity. We've been publishing on that as well. Uh, yeah, and so you can do funny renderings, m more appealing renderings of those artificial dancer um, in a way. So that's an example of of using scientific research and then starting to um, play with it as, is, as to generate uh, eventual uh, artwork. But what's interesting with those systems is not only trying to mimic the human and do style imitation, but also eventually do style interpolation and style extrapolation. You know, having avatars that are more happy than a, a human can look uh, happy, a bit like a cartoon character would maybe, and eventually, um, eventually have types of dances that we know you men can't do. So that's, that's the idea of not just um, modeling creativity as it is, but also looking at creativity as it could be, and eventually using computers for doing things as a human in general, but an artist in particular, that we wouldn't be able to do with uh, computers. So that's gonna be it for me. I'll finish by saying that this is work with colleagues and students, and then if you're interested in creative AI or generative art, I give an online uh, there's thousands of people taking it. Uh, CalArts started this online program for art education because a lot of institutions are teaching online business and, <laughs> and, and engineering. Uh, very few are teaching philosophy, aesthetics, and art. And if we don't, given that 7% of the world population goes to university and 88% has the internet, if we don't teach online culture and art, uh, we are going to end up losing momentum. So that's a class, it's free and uh, it's online, as many class on that MOOC, so I wanted to do the plug, of course. And then the next workshop I'm organizing on generative music will be next year with the International Conference on Computational Creativity, which will be your go-to if you want to know more about using AI and machine learning for creative purposes. And then MOCO, the Movement uh, Computation Conference, will be organized by the people at ASU next year. I want to thank the funding body that are so generous in Canada, and thank you for your attention too.